Parliament has now risen for the winter recess after a particularly busy few weeks. But while the cost of living, nuclear power and the decision of a senator to quit the Labor Party has certainly dominated much of the debate, some things do struggle for a look in. And that includes what many consider to be the crisis in Australia's mental health services. There was some extra money for mental health in the May budget, but demand for services is surging. And finding an appointment with a psychologist or psychiatrist is proving increasingly difficult. We've long heard about the mental health crisis in Australia. What I'm keen to explore here is whether that crisis is getting any better or indeed getting any worse. I'm David Spears on Ngunnawal Country here at Parliament House in Canberra. Welcome to Insiders on Background. Pat McGorry is Professor of Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. He's also the Executive Director of the non-profit Youth Mental Health Service Origin. And he's, of course, also a former Australian of the Year. Pat McGorry, welcome. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much, David. I think we bumped into each other, in fact, in the corridor here at Parliament House. Might have been in Budget Week itself. Uh, and we talked about doing this podcast, so it's it's terrific to finally uh, be sitting down and, and doing it with you. Look, just if you can, start by painting a picture for us of what Australia's mental health system looks like at the moment. Where are the most serious pressure points? Um, thanks, David. Well, I think if we just go back even 20 or 30 years... Um, the, the, the problem started then when we closed all the, all the mental hospitals around the country. Uh, there was a, a kind of a huge amount of real estate tied up in mental health care, but it was a 19th century model. So it was right to close them. But unfortunately, governments, state and federal, have not built a, a system to replace them. And, and uh, so um, people are in, in real trouble now. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, that, that's got worse and worse uh, over that period. We've had... Royal Commission Victoria arising from that public policy failure. Every other state is in the same situation and the federal government has not yet stepped into the breach to to, to help us, uh, certainly not sufficiently. So So those services haven't been adequate and at the same time, is it right to say that demand has also surged? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, a whole range of other conditions apart from the, those that were treated in those hospitals that have, have come to the fore. And we've seen a, a huge rise in prevalence in, in people in this transitional age range of uh, puberty through to the mid-20s, the uh, emerging adults as we call them. That, that there's been a 50% rise in prevalence of mental illness in that age group over the last 15 years alone. 50% so, increase. 50%. Wow. Now, the ABS uh, do regular surveys of, of, uh, of the mental health of Australians, very high quality surveys, and uh, they showed a rise from 26% of young people, that's teenagers and young adults, in 2007 to 39% in, t- in 2021. So mm. that's a staggering increase. If that was happening in any other disease area, there would be, you know, moral panic. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. And is it a, a gender split on that as well? Is it more girls and young women? Yeah, great question. Uh, yes, it is. Um, it's 48% of young women, teenagers and young, wow. and, and young adults. And that, that is not um, just distressed young people. This is people with a, a diagnostic threshold level and a need for care of some sort. You know, um, so what are we talking about there? Um, 48% of young women, that's a huge number. What sort of diagnostic uh, issues are we talking about? Well, that survey captures mostly the common mental disorders like anxiety, depression, maybe um, eating disorders are, are in there too. Uh, it doesn't capture the more uh, severe and, and persistent illnesses um, like schizophrenia, bipolar, anorexia, uh, well, uh, anorexia nervosa is a more severe eating disorder, um, or borderline personality. These are, these are the ones that, um, what we, that make up the missing middle, as we say, which primary care isn't really equipped to deal with. And are you able to say what's driven and what is driving that increase in um, diagnosis? Well, we've been looking at that at Origin, studying that very carefully through the Origin Institute, and we, we've also conducted a worldwide review um, with from 50 different countries, which is going to be published in the Lancet Psychiatry Journal in August. It's a it's a commission, the Lancet commissioned uh, this this work, and it's 85 pages of analysis. Can you give us uh, a sneak peek? Yeah, um, well, (laughs) I don't know if we've really got the answer, but we've certainly understood that there are several mega trends uh, that have been occurring over the last 20, 30 years. Um, And obviously that the the, the, the easy scapegoat is social media and and governments uh, and and, and popular science writers are jumping on that bandwagon. It's definitely got some very harmful effects. 
but it's not the total explanation. We, we think that uh, other, other mega trends like climate change, like um, the socio socioeconomic changes, we've seen tremendous intergenerational um, inequality develop over the last 20, 30 years, as reflected in things like you know rental prices and housing prices and you know, the rising cost of, of education, hex fees and, and the like. So the precarity of young people in this transitional period has increased um, a lot. They're, they're fascinating the factors. Just to, um, I mean, social media is obviously often cited by all sides of politics at the moment. They mm -hmm. want to do something about it. Would you agree that there needs to be much tighter limits, age restrictions on social media access? Well, I, I don't think um, the age restriction has been talked about a lot, but that's the, the, the low-hanging fruit, which is probably not necessarily going to work. Um, what, what they don't like to talk about, the politicians and, and uh, the pundits, is what to do about the techno-feudalists, uh, as Yanis Varoufakis, you know, the uh, former Greek finance fa minister who wrote a book about this, uh, talks about. I mean, these are the people controlling these media platforms who are extremely powerful, and they've done some pretty awful things the in, in terms of the way these platforms are operated mm. and, and, and uh, The structured. algorithms and the... Yeah, all of that, yeah. So that, that should be the, the focus uh, as much as anything so. else. And you mentioned climate change as well. Just to be clear, are you talking about pe young people worried about the impact of climate change, what that's going to mean for the planet's future? Yeah, I, th I think if you just look at the, the, their perspective on life, it's 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 precarious, it's pessimistic, and climate change is definitely feeding to that. Something mm -hmm. like two thirds, two or three quarters of young people are, are worried or extremely worried about about that that issue. It's a bit like nuclear power used to be, or, or sorry, nuclear war used to be when I was uh, in their in their age group. And mm -hmm. you, it's just a chronic sort of sense of anxiety, but it's piled on top of all of these other mega trends which are undermining their security. So, I mean, we've we've heard over many years that we've got a crisis in mental health. It sounds like these figures you're talking about, it, it is only getting worse. How would you characterise mental health um, at the moment in Australia? Well, I think there's a bit of inertia. Um, we, we've we've done some good things. We are world leaders in the youth mental health area. We, we've we've developed services like Headspace and and we've structured in at least in Victoria the services are covering this 12 to 25 age range in 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 a, in a, in a uh, sort of, I suppose innovative way. But it's it's too little, too late. Uh, we have inspired 15 other countries to go down this track and, and restructure and invest in this area of mental health care. But it's it's um it's like uh this, it, it's not appropriate to the scale of the problem mm. it is doing something but it's it's as i say too little too late it needs to be a, a top priority within health reform and is is the priority does the priority need to be uh that early intervention that you've so much focused on yeah i mean these illnesses even the more severe ones like schizophrenia that i started off my career in are, are much more amenable to treatment if you if you diagnose them quickly in the early stage just like with cancer or heart disease you mm. you prevent a lot of the complications and you give people a much better chance of recovery so we've got great evidence for that and the, and the easy thing for government here is which they seem reluctant to really you know embrace um, this is the best investment in healthcare i mean investing more and more money in older people with um, cancer and and other forms of, of of illness. You've got to do that on a hu hu on a human basis. But but in terms of the economics of it, it's a much better investment to invest in primary care and in and mental health care in young people because you get an incredible return on investment. You, you can actually then get much better levels of recovery. People are able to work. They pay taxes, and it pays for itself many times over. So by not investing in this area, you, you you're actually costing the health system money. Why do you suspect that's not happening? Is it because there's still a difference, big difference seen between mental illness and other forms of illness? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't 100% know the answer to that question because it's so obvious, you know, in terms of logic and, and, and evidence as a thing to do. But as you know better than most people, David, um, decisions by government are often not taken on the basis of logic or, or economics even. They're, they're taken on the basis of the politics. And unfortunately, uh, the Australian public have not insisted or demanded that their governments actually address this problem. But we, surely with the numbers you're talking about, that's that's got to change, right? I mean, well, everybody has a connection to these issues of anxiety, depression. We all have someone in our lives who's battling with this. Yeah, well, even more than ever. And, and, and it's just simmering below the surface. If you talk to anybody uh, in, in, in the community, that they, they themselves or, or someone close to them has had a significant problem with mental health and problem with getting access to mental health care. But... But that has not translated yet mm. into political action. So we set up an organisation called Australians for Mental Health in 2010, 2011, and it's been 
trying to sort of mobilise in an activist type way the, the Australian public, but we haven't been able to get enough investment from supporters to actually make that campaign, that standing campaign, effective. Um, mm-hmm. If we could do that, I think we, we could unlock, we could give people confidence that this is a not a wicked problem, but a solvable problem, and we could make a lot of progress. You, you touched on there, and I'm, I'm just keen to explore this, because the, the difficulty in finding, uh, in accessing either a psychiatrist or a psychologist, it just seems um, amazing at, at the moment how difficult mm-hmm. it is. Why, why is it so hard? Yeah, well, I, I suppose there's a mismatch between the, you know the the scale of the of, of the system um, and and the and the workforce and and the problem. But I think the model, you know, if you just step back and look look at what's happened to mental, uh, healthcare in general and particularly mental health care, we privatised it basically. We were operating it on a small business model, and it's fragmented into a million pieces. So you get all these private practices everywhere, um, which are obviously dependent on, on the government with, through Medicare yeah. to, a, to a significant extent, but it's a very ineffective model. There's, um, no, there's most... no public hospital equivalent in mental health. No, no. well, uh, and, and since we the beds were reduced dramatically, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we're dependent on the community and, and, and the sort of um, the, the, the outside of hospital care, which is either, either fragmented into, into many pieces through the, the competitive tendering through primary health networks, so you get all these millions of NGOs providing little bits and packages of care in a very fragmented way, or you've got the private practices, the, the, the private psychologists, the private psychiatrists, and the GPs. It's all poorly coordinated and, and, and fragmented, and so people don't get what they need. What they really need is platforms of multidisciplinary care, one-stop shops, which, like Headspace in the primary care area, but the next level up needs to be mm-hmm. you know, very strong, um, comprehensive, holistic platforms of care where people are working in teams, not working in their own little small businesses and, and having a life, 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 lifestyle and not really driven by vocational or, or, or logic. Or, and the financial models are to blame as well. I, I don't want to blame the practitioners per se. They've just done what suits them. But that's not the best sort of health policy system that we, we could have. So there was some new money in the budget uh, for a few different things. Uh, there was a boost, for example, to the head to health centres for yep. people with um, moderate to severe needs. Uh, and I think there were more uh, of the low intensity online free services. <coughs> Just explain to us what did come in the recent yep. budget and how effective it, it's likely to be. Yeah, I, I look, it's a step in the right direction. I, 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 along with Mental Health Victoria and Australians Mental Health, I lobbied um, Greg Hunt to actually put those head-to-health centres in, in place for the adult population. Mm. And the model was based on evidence. It was a multidisciplinary team-based model, but then it got diluted and, and, and um, um, I think, uh, dissipated, really, in the way it was actually implemented. So right. what Mark Butler has done now is actually put the specialisation back into it. So how uh, do they work? It's a, it's a centre you can go to that will have, what, a, a GP, a psychologist and a psychiatrist all in the one <coughs> building? Yeah, and, and, and probably other mental health professionals, case managers, and it's salary-based, which is, a, is exactly mm-hmm. what's needed, not, not MBS-based. And, and um, what Mark Butler has done is put uh, psychiatrists and psychologists into it instead of the kind of more dilute model that, that had been previously in but place. But we don't have many of them. Is that the problem? I think they're planning to have 61, and, and they're meant to be a resource, really, for the local GPs to refer into as well, a bit like what Headspace was, 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 was meant to be. But Headspace is only funded at the level of $1 million per centre, whereas these centres are funded at, at $4 million per centre. So, again, I think uh, we need to bring Headspace up to that level of funding so it's able to perform the same function for young people that these head-to-health centres will do for adults. And they're proven to work? You're confident that this is the right model? Well, it's based on a lot of evidence uh, showing that um, uh, multidisciplinary care in the community is, is, is highly effective, especially if it's, if it's linked to assertive outreach models and, and home-based treatment for acute phases of illness. So the, that model could be built on to, to be even more effective based on the research that's been done over the years, both... And, and that needs to happen mm. for young people as well as for the the older adults, which the Head to Health focuses on. And what about the online services? How effective... Are they? Are there, are, you know, are there some, to put it bluntly, mm. cowboys in the system as well who churn through uh, uh, clients? Yeah, I, th- I think um, the whole online uh, digital mental health has, has largely failed ar- uh, uh, to deliver on its potential uh, so far. But uh, we have a program at Origin called MOST, Moderated Online Social Therapy, which has been developed based on 13 years of NHMRC research led by Mario Alvarez, one of our leaders at Origin. 
and it is now in five states integrated with face-to-face -face care in head spaces and youth mental health services. So this is very evidence-based. It, it, it strengthens the face-to-face -face and complements the face-to-face -face care, and it's, 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 it retains people. Um, mo most of the other sort of single uh, sort of function apps, people sign up for them, and then you know, a, a few weeks later they've all dropped out. So the, the, you, we really need to make it a, an evidence-based reform, and it's got huge potential, but it has to be done properly, and I think the government is looking at that now with these with this investment um, that they announced in the budget. So that is a welcome thing too. Mm. So, Pat McGorry, if you were making the decisions on how to allocate you know, finite resources, um, what would you do? Well, if you look at the NDIS, um, you know, that, that is spending over $40 billion a year on something like 660000 Australians, mainly with physical disability, or there is some coverage of mental illness in there too. We're spending 12 billion a year on 5 million Australians with mental illness. That imbalance, that asymmetry, is just almost the wrong way around. I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't support people with physical disability in the best possible way, but, but we've also, you know, we need parity here, and we need parity with physical health care. Only 50% of Australians with a mental health problem get access to, to treatment, and only 15% of that treatment is, is of uh, acceptable, acceptable quality. That, if that was happening in breast cancer or asthma or diabetes, there would be an outcry. So it's and, about and health, this is a really health interesting equity. point. I mean, it sounds it sounds so sensible to say it should get there should be parity between mental health and other health services. What would that mean, do you think, in terms of um, yeah. the billions that would be injected? Well. Um, p parity has been parroted, sorry about the pun, but, uh, for, for a long time, in, uh, but it's, its lip service has been paid to it and, and uh, it really needs to happen. And as I say, the, the, in a budgetary sense, it would pay for itself if this was done because the, the returns on investment are, are very significant in mental health care and much greater than what you see in physical health care. So as long as you're delivering evidence-based care, you're going to, it's going to pay for itself several times over. All right, just to challenge that, though, um, we, we heard similar about the NDIS, that the investment would more than pay off. We've oh. since seen the ballooning cost of the NDIS. Would there be a risk that um, with mental health you could also really see the costs escalate? Um, I think the NDIS is a classic example of, of there's very there's almost zero chance of return on investment because to get into the scheme you've got to have you've got to say that the disorder or the disability is is completely untreatable it's mm. fixed and permanent so there's no poss possibility of recovery whereas with mental illness uh, recovery is one of the hallmarks of what we're aiming mm. for and what we achieve so so I think it's the opposite um, the NDIS is like the base case where you get very low return on investment and, and but with mental health care you get a uh, very high level even compared to cancer because cancer happens in late life mostly where the opportunities for the return on investment are just not there. Mm. There was a lot of focus back in April with the, the tragic Bondi Junction stabbing. Joel Couchy um, killed six people and a lot of focus on mental health and what support mm. could have, should have prevented that. Um, did anything really change since then? I don't think so. Um, I've, I've actually got an opportunity to talk to the Premier um, next week about that. Um, definitely got some suggestions for him uh, about what could be done. I trained in New South Wales before I moved to Victoria, so very keen to help mm. if, if, if we can. But this, this, it's, the, it's the same problem, that the, the legacy of deinstitutionalisation and a complete failure of community mental health care. This boy, uh, this man, sorry, that, that committed those, those, those crimes when he, was, when he was obviously acutely ill, um, had been well treated in Queensland um, for I think about 15 years and there was no evidence of any sort of uh, character problem or any violence or aggression but um, when he descended into, into, un in, into illness because of um, uh, a failure to treat him, he was uh, out of treatment for I think several years, mm. became homeless and who knows what was in his mind at the time but he clearly uh, dropped out of, of, of what had been an effective system of care up until that point. And just finally, how do we compare, how does Australia compare internationally when it comes to getting it right with mental health services? Well, I, I would say nearly all the innovations in mental health, and, and they've been scientifically based, uh, uh, have largely come from Australia over the last 20, 30 years during my career. Um, and, and we have, I suppose, demonstrated that they work, but, but pretty much failed to make them available to across the board to all Australians. So... Uh, other countries have picked up those reforms and implemented them more successfully in, in some cases, particularly for early intervention for psychosis and schizophrenia. Um, 
So we're, we're the innovators, but we're, we're pretty poor at, at, at really sort of uh, bringing home the bacon, if I can put it that way. And mm. Other countries are better than that, but, but other countries are more conservative and, and, and less imaginative, I suppose. But, but, uh, but we, we, we really we could do so much better. It, it, this country's got so much potential to, to really uh, continue to lead the world in the reform. Well, Professor Pat McGorry, really appreciate you explaining to us what's going on when it comes to mental health services and really appreciate the work that you do. Thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you very much, David. Really Mm. appreciate it. If this conversation's raised any issues for you, don't forget Lifeline is uh, on 13 11 14 and Beyond Blue, 1300 224 636. Now, we're keen to hear your thoughts on this conversation and any suggestions you might have for the podcast, any ideas you'd like us to explore, please rate, review, subscribe wherever you're listening to this. And if you've got uh, anything to let us know about, please drop us an email, insiders at abc.net.au. We'll be back in your feed next week with the podcast. Otherwise, we'll see you Sunday morning for Insiders. Bye for now.